into the harbour of St. Peter Port on Guernsey in the Channel Islands, steams a British warship with the white ensign flying. A tumultuous welcome awaits the liberators of the islands. Incidentally, the oldest British possession and the only British territory to be occupied by the Germans during the war. The German guard marches out from the ancient castle. The German commander is marched away and all equipment is handed in. The proclamation of liberty is read and the Union Jack hoisted. With their rightful flag flying once again above them, the islanders give themselves over to Victory Day celebrations. And then a few weeks later, their majesties, the king and queen, came to visit their dear islands, landing on Jersey. As their majesties came ashore from the six-inch gun cruiser Jamaica, the terrific enthusiasm of the islanders was a fitting response to the royal affection and feeling which prompted the visit. The visit to Guernsey, which was made by air, was the Queen's first official flight. Below could be seen first the island and then the acres of glass houses for fruit and vegetable forcing. little girls presented bouquets, tributes from the islands of Guernsey, Alderney and Sark. The simple ceremony linking more closely the bond already strengthened by their majesty's gracious visit. A tank that carries its own bridge for crossing streams and canals is being assembled here. This Churchill trundles out to collect the bridge, picking it up with its own hydraulic crane. The locking pins move up and engage. Hey, don't drop that thing. The bridge can be lowered into position in a matter of minutes, and though surprisingly light, can carry the heaviest tanks. Later, the bridge can be picked up and taken on to the next obstacle. This is another sort of tank-borne bridge called the Scissors, which is mounted on a Valentine or Covenant a chassis. And again, this British invention works swiftly and easily.
At a forward base in the Pacific, Australian troops and their equipment embark in transports for the attack on Tarakan Island off the east coast of Borneo. Their commander-in-chief, General Blamey, is there to see them off, and the air forces are seeing off the Japanese. Liberators maintained a 12-day service with bombs and leaflets before the sea party arrived. Final briefing with contour maps and the battle is on. The Japanese withdrew inland but were cleaned up later. Another Pacific island was cleared by the untiring and gallant efforts of Australia's fighting men. London gives General Dwight Eisenhower a tremendous welcome as he drives with Air Chief Marshal Tedder to the Guildhall to receive the citizenship of the city. Londoners gave the leader of the victorious British and American forces a warm place in their hearts as he gave them Mr. Churchill's V-sign. The official tribute was a sword of honour and the freedom of the city of London. The cheering crowds of Cockneys were the unofficial tribute. And the general spoke to his newfound fellow citizens. Whether or not you know it, I am now a Londoner myself. I've got just as much right to be down in that crowd yelling as you have. We can now have crowds. There can be happy gatherings. You don't have to listen for a motor in the sky and wonder whether there's a pilot in the blankety-blank thing or not. <laughs> the job that has been done, you people have done. You, you and the others like you through all the United Nations. a word of thanks for your hospitality to my soldiers that came into your country in great numbers, often to your very great inconvenience, if not irritation. <laughs> to every Londoner that has ever taken one of my soldiers into his home, I say you'll always have my profound gratitude. You have done something in cementing bonds that must always remain between your country and mine, and into which scope must be brought Russia, France, China, all the other great countries that have helped to whip this Nazi, and we hope will quickly whip Japan. Yeah.